Now we're going to look, um, after that break, at coaxial cavity magnetrons. And remember, these were the first uh, microwave uh, devices that were used, RF energy, in the microwave region. And they go back to World War II and the famous Tizard uh, mission where Britain had developed a, uh, a, co a cavity magnetron. Not, qu not quite this design. Um, uh, but it's a, uh, it's a power oscillator. In other words, it's a free-running device. And what you can do is you can tap into it, and then a little later, tap into it. But there's not coherency from pulse to pulse. One thing you can do is you can measure the phase difference from pulse to pulse and do some compensating later. But it isn't the true coherency from pulse to pulse that you have with the, with the coherent systems that I talked about before. Uh, typically, the average power is limited to a kilowatt or two. And because of the poor noise and the stability characteristics I just mentioned, they're restricted just for MTI use. You wouldn't use them when you were coherently integrating a number of pulses. But uh, as I, I meant, I dwelled over that fact. They're well suited for inexpensive marine radars. And the way they work generally is you have a, an electric and magnetic field that are perpendicular. Here are the electric field lines. And perpendicular coming out would be the magnetic field lines back and forth. Uh, the electrons emitted from the cathode travel around a circular path in bunches. The electrons interact with the electromagnetic fields and give up their energies to the RF field. And again, here's where the output would go. And this would be onto a coaxial, uh, co a coaxial connector. And this would be a window between the coax, uh, between the waveguide output and, uh, or if they're low power. Now I, I love show and tell. When a microwave broke, this is what we, this is what broke. A magnetron. And this little good, good guy here is a magnetron. And, um, and it's about a kilowatt of peak power. And this is what heats up your chicken soup. And here you can see where the, where, uh, let's see, which seemed to be more probable for, this, it looks like this is probably where the uh, microwave energy comes out. And this is where your AC, this is where the power comes in. And these are cooling vanes. Keep, cause it isn't a hundred percent efficient. And one of these little guys costs a hundred dollars. I mean, you, you, you could have got, uh, you know, uh, Germany and Japan would have paid a big pile of change to have one of these during World War II. But uh, j just to show you what these what these guys look like. So I saw once and I couldn't find it. Someone took a um, a metal cutting saw and cut right through it so you could see the innards of the cavities. Now I've gone over in a very simple way. I've showed you how an op a magnetron operates. If you pick up um, a book on transmitters and it has a, a chapter on the history and the evolution of magnetrons. It's extremely complicated electromagnetism on how these coupling slots are developed and how the, uh, the coupling was made to work and not to be something simple and the way I'm talking about. Very complex modes were used and it took, took a lot of very bright theoreticians and, and physicists and, and then to go through and to figure out how to make the best magnetrons and better and better and better for their use during World War II. And obviously, I mean, if you've got a microwave, you know, uh, at home, you've got one of these guys. So here are some pictures of some microwave uh, magnetrons. This one at X-Band, and you can see the magnet giving you uh, the magnetic field across of it, the output port to a waveguide, Similar here, and you can see the, the magnet. Uh, this one has a, uh, a peak power of one megawatt, tenth of a 
of a percent duty cycle, uh, three and a half microseconds. It's liquid cooled because you're going. This is a significant amount. You can't use the the, the veins here to get rid of uh, the, the inefficiencies of this kind of a device, and it's a fixed frequency. And likewise, this is this is mechanically tunable in frequency. I see a potentiometer up here. At least it looks like it to my eye. That might be how it's tuned. And this will put out a two microsecond pulse, a little less duty cycle. You can see they're low duty cycle devices. Okay, there are a lot of other different types of high power amplifiers. And I just want to point out two of them. There are hybrid, hybrid klystrons uh, called uh, twistrons extended at interaction klystron and, ca and clustered cavity klystrons. These are hybrids of klystrons and they replace one or more of the resonant cavities to give it wide bandwidth and these have been used in low power and millimeter wave transmitters. And gyrotrons which have also yielded high power in millimeter wave region or on operational radars fielded and they require very high magnetic fields. But I, I wanted to get into the view that there are these other devices and that the technology has grown into the millimeter wave region and that these systems are in use. Okay, now we're going to go to the outline and we're going to continue on uh, to solid state RF power amplifiers and we're going to look at transmit receive modules. Okay, to have a transmit receive module, you got to have solid state power transistors to be your amplifiers. And here are some different examples of how here's a, a buy, you can buy these from Macon. Uh, these are off the shelf items. Uh, here, here they're, they're MOSFET power transistors. And th these run from 100 to 500 megahertz, 100 uh, and 50 watts. At 90 watts, S band, a uh, pulsed power transistors. And here's a pulsed power amplifier module that's 200 watts at S band, 200 microseconds pulsed with a 10% duty cycle. And here's the size of a pencil. So, what I'm showing you here is that you can build solid state transistors that can give you the power. So, the solid state, uh, building blocks for solid state amplifiers and their great advantage is they've got a very small footprint low profile and of course since they're solid state they're going to have very high reliability uh, I want to spend a few minutes going over the general issues with solid state power trans uh, generation of solid state power what we do for the most part right now is we uh, the standard transistor amplifiers use silicon bipolar or gallium arsenide technology and uh, and that's how we generate the power for the device. They're inherently low power, high gain. They operate, operate with low voltage and high reliability and to increase the power, and this is very important, the transistors are operated in parallel with more than one stage. And, and uh, I'm going to show you one where there are multiple, multiple stages. And I think the one I'm going to show you is like this. You can have, you'd start off with two in series as the driver stage, and then two in parallel for that driver stage as a second stage, and follow that with four in parallel as the final stage. The solid state power devices cannot operate at high peak power. Uh, 50 watts average power transistor cannot operate much over 200 watts of peak power without overheating. So you're going to have to, that says two things. You're going to have to use a lot of them if you want to generate high peak power. And you're going to have um, uh, long pulses. In this case, 25% duty cycle. And pulse compression is going to be needed for your range resolution, to get good reasonable range resolution to work. Solid state amplifiers are used in radars for low power applications and for high power applications. And high power applications, 
there's been over the past couple of decades there's been a great deal of fantastic research and development done to allow us to have the technology to build very high power overall transmitter systems with, uh, to individu into individually in the transmitter give you higher power and also to, when you put them together you'll have very usable um, usable componentry of subset subsystems so that they'll be able to use in radars. Now many modules are distributed on mechanically scanned planar arrays. So what you'll do is you'll have uh, a mechanically stand uh, mechanically scanned planar array of of, tra of uh, solid state devices. A, a module that contains many elements of an electrically scanned phased array is called an active aperture. Okay. Now here, here is an example, and it's a great one because it's the first all solid state active aperture electronically steered phased array radar. And uh, we've used them around, we've used them since the 70s. Uh, they're at UHF band, uh, and they're used for detection and warning of a potential sea-launched missile attack, particularly during the Cold War. These were a very important part of our national warning system. Uh, each face, and this particular face, I believe is, this particular radar, I believe is the one at Cape Cod. Called, they're called the PAVE Pause Radar. PAVE is one of the acronyms the, Pe the Pentagon thinks up, but they put PAUSE for I don't think pause like a dog, phased array warning system. Uh, but anyway, they have uh, 1,792 active transmit receive modules. So that there's an, a module right here in the right. And as I remember, it's about this big by this big, you know, about that big by that big. And it's uh, it puts out 340 watts of peak power, each one. And we've got, uh, you know, close to 2,000 of them in each face. And you can see a big ladder here where if one wants to go over and do some repair or whatever, you can move the ladder over to change modules or do what repair needs to be made. Okay. Uh, another example of a solid-state radar is the TPS-59. It's an air surveillance radar developed for the U.S. military. It has a rotating planar L-band array. And the array you can see here is 15 feet wide by uh, 30 feet long. Each transmitter module has a, a 10 of 100 watt amplifier units consisting of two 55 watt silicon bipolar transistors and seven watts of gain driven by a smaller 25 watt device. Uh, each transmitter module feeds one of 54 rows. So what you have is one transmitter model feeding each one of 54 rows. And uh, uh, an air traffic control, uh, this, this, inside this dome is a uh, uh, an antenna that's, uh, I'm almost 100% sure, uh, uh, shaped for a Cosecan squared pattern. Uh, so you'll have good uh, air traffic control antenna coverage. But these are located up uh, in Canada uh, for air traffic control surveillance. And they were developed for Canada by Raytheon of Canada. And they have a solid state transmitter with a peak power of 28 kilowatts, peak power, 7% uh, duty cycle. And there are 14 modules each count them all down and here's a, the cabinet with all 14 different modules and each consisting of 42 100 watt peak silicon bipolar transistors in a 2 8 32 configuration so you can see that uh, the and the RF power modules are combined into pairs then seven of these combined into one transmitter only six are needed 
to support the sensitivity requirements. So they have a seventh one as a backup. And here is another example, this is a solid state transmitter, the radar surveillance technology experimental radar, that's nicknamed RISTER, that was uh, built uh, as a system by Lincoln Laboratory. But Westinghouse built the, uh, the uh, here's the power cabinet, and here's the power amplifier modules and the driver modules. 14 channels with 140 kilowatts total peak power, 8 kilowatts of average power, and it's located up in this antenna here. And each channel is supplied by a power amplifier module, which is 10 kilowatts peak power. Okay, now when you look at, hey, you talk to me about tubes, you talk to me about transistor, hey, hey, hey where do you go? And, and this is a rough um, uh, tube domain, solid state amplifier domain. And then within solid state amplifiers, there are different technologies that are, you know, like gall ga um, gallium arsenide. Uh, versus another technology that are moving in different directions and different powers. So this, this what I'm showing you is as technology changes will change. But in, the, in generally, when you're looking for an awful lot of average power over the entire microwave region, tube amplifiers are the way to go. Uh, unless you're really willing to pay an enormous price and you're willing to uh, use uh, solid state amplifiers and use millions of them. Not millions of them, but uh, tens of thousands of them. You know, a huge numbers of them with uh, TR modules that I'm going to show you in a minute where they overlap. But generally, and this is what I call the region of competition and the use. Now, comparing in general terms uh, the tube, vacuum tube amplifiers and solid state amplifiers, the output power, and these are just for the amplifiers, not the whole radar as a whole. With solid state amplifiers, you put a lot of them together. Uh, you know, you, you're getting the order of tens to hundreds of watts out of the solid state amplifier, and they, they cost about hundreds of dollars. You get high power tens of kilowatts to a megawatt of output power for the amplifiers and the, co the cost per unit uh, is high from tens of thousands to 600,000 now for, uh, for uh, that X-band uh, variant it's up in the, it's a, it's a half a million dollar plus or minus 10 to 20 percent and the cost per watt um, is in this range and it's quite variable over the solid state amplifiers depending upon uh, a lot of different issues of what technology you're using them and how you're using them. Uh, these are very bulky and heavy. These have a very small footprint. And the vacuum tube amplifiers tend to be used on passive arrays and on dish antennas while solid state amplifiers you'll see used in active arrays and in digital arrays. Now on the method of amplification, we've looked at tube amplifiers and we've looked at solid state amplifiers. You've got to do some trading off. Obviously, the trade-offs you're going to do are average power efficiency at the desired operating frequency, the efficiency of the amplifier itself, instantaneous and tunable bandwidth. Do you really need wide bandwidth so you can have very, very good range resolution? The duty cycle, how narrow the range resolution you want, and is the duty, uh, the gain of it, so how much po total power you can get out. Reliability, boy, that's always in uh, the favor of a solid state system. And cost can be an issue uh, either way. And, uh, the multi and we'll see later on other factors come into play in an overall radar system. I'm just talking about high power amplifier is a high power amplifier not its system use because there are certain usages where you're tracking very fast targets where you want to use a lot of 
um, solid state amplifiers all together in a big square in a phased array so you can chase a fast moving missile. Uh, excuse me, you can, you can, you can track and, um, and detect a whole bunch of fast moving missiles where you'd only be able to with a dish system, which the tube amplifiers tend to go with. You only got one target and what's in the beam to track. So there are other system issues coming into play. Now we're going to uh, take a break here before we go on to receivers and waveform generators that will be uh, the next lecture.